Members, it's now time for questions to the Minister uh, for Social Development. Um, we will start firstly with listed questions, and I call Chris Hazard. Can I call you Kesh Everhain, that whole question number one. The Financial Support Service was part of a wider package of measures designed to support claimants to achieve and maintain uh, financial independence. These measures include the departmental funding of frontline advice services delivered by the advice sector and also the provision of benefit entitlement checks that are carried out by the Social Security Agent Agency Improving Benefit Uptake Team. These checks help ensure that claimants across Northern Ireland are receiving all the money they are entitled to in an effort to tackle uh, poverty and improve lives for those who are most vulnerable. Where appropriate, claimants were offered access to loans and grants from the Social Fund discretionary provision, benefit entitlement checks, and given information about the support and advice services that are available to them in the independent advice sector. Uptake of the support and advice provided by the independent advice sector was voluntary. The service was delivered by face-to-face -face and telephony, and the face-to-face -face service was piloted from the 19th of May to the 15th of August 2014 in the Falls Road, uh, Sturban, uh, Oma Jobs and Benefit Offices. The telephony service was provided by a central telephony service in Oma Jobs and Benefit Office. The evaluation of the pilot showed that there was elements of the service that were more successful than others. Results of referrals to the agency improving benefit uptake for benefit entitlement checks were positive, and 142 claimants were identified with a potential entitlement to benefit. 14 claimants have successfully claimed another benefit. The total of annual benefit and arrears for the nine claims is £48,780.51. Up-to-date details of the actual entitlement cannot be obtained at this time, as claimants need time to claim benefit for the benefits to be assessed. However, indications are that the benefit entitlement for claimants referred from the Financial Support Service will increase as time progresses. I call Chris Hazard for supplementary. I thank the, the Minister for his answer. Given that just more than 2,500 um, claimants were actually interviewed um, and at a cost of more than £100,000 per office uh, that was involved in this, uh, could I ask the Minister perhaps to outline just his analysis of it? You know, where could this money have been spent better ways in, in this whole process? Yes, and, and I do appreciate uh, the concerns that were raised and have been raised by a number in relation to the overall uh, cost of this particular pilot. And I certainly uh, have uh, asked that uh, we take cognizance of the fact that uh, this was a cost. When you look at the breakdown uh, of the, the total spend on the financial support service, the breakdown of the spend so that I think it, it, it's worth having it on the public record, the project team salary costs were somewhere in the region of 221,000. The operational staff salary costs were 47. The general administrative expenses were 8,000, and the capital costs, that is IT development, was somewhere in the region of 35,000. So, I think that when you look at it as a ballpark figure, it certainly is something uh, that uh, raises a, a, a question around was that money. Uh, spent in the best possible way. I'm reasonably content that, in terms of a pilot, that we did get information that is able to be used in the future when we look at how we would roll out this service as a wider part of the benefit take-up process. I wouldn't conclude that this is the only show in town, that this is the only way that we would do this, and there have been lessons learned, and I think we need to ensure that those lessons are implemented as we move forward, particularly with the introduction of universal credit. As members can hear, we are picking up some interference, so I would ask members to check their electronic equipment to make sure that it is in an appropriate position and not causing disruption. I, I call Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for his answers thus far? And given the, the Minister's previous answer, can I ask him what successes were achieved by the Financial Support Service pilot? I thank the, the member for her question. And I think, again, in, in, any, in any pilot, what you want to try and establish is what were those actual 
uh, successes? What were the things which were the lessons that were learned that we could continue to implement in, in some other way? And the collaborative process between the advice sector and the Social Security Agency worked well during the pilot and fully demonstrated how the department and the agency and the advice sector could work together in a joined up and a coherent way that embraces the concept of providing enhanced support for claimants. And I think that's one of the, the issues that is certainly key for me in terms of how we roll out the services uh, to uh, our uh, constituents, and that is that there is a joined up working approach between the department, between the Social Security Agency and the vibrant, strong, independent advice a sector that we have in Northern Ireland, and I think that that was one of the key elements because they were involved in drawing up the process, they were engaged fully through the pilot, and I think that their advice and their help in this process was invaluable. I call Dominic Bradley. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, could I ask the Minister, uh, given the fact that uh, there are major changes coming uh, in the welfare area, major cuts, some, some want to call them reform, I prefer to call them cuts, what um, uh, is there in what he has learned from this pilot scheme? Uh, which will benefit uh, people who uh, are on benefits in the new situation. I thank the member for his, his supplementary. I, I'm, I'm not really sure uh, where the member has been for the last number of weeks in relation to uh, the line that has been trotted out uh, about benefit cuts. I think that there's one thing that I have seen over the last number of weeks uh, in coming to the department is if you look at the projection of benefit uptake in Northern Ireland. We will move between now and 2018 from a position of a welfare bill of somewhere in the region of 4.4 billion to a welfare bill somewhere <coughs> in the region of 6.3 billion. So I'm somewhat uh, at a loss to know as to where exactly the member means in relation to benefit cuts. I assume what he really is making reference to is the challenge that we will have in ensuring that those people who face particular challenges, that their needs are being addressed. That is part of what I believe we have achieved in relation to the Stormont House Agreement. But it is also a duty on my part and the Department's responsibility in Social Security to ensure that, as we have already said in the previous answer, that through the independent advice sector, through the work that my department in the Social Security Agency carries out in relation to benefit uptake, that we do genuinely listen to, whether it's through the uh, pilot that was uh, uh, carried out or whether through other schemes that we are currently looking at, that we do all that we possibly can to ensure that all relevant, useful, valuable information is available to claimants so that they make the right decisions in relation to this very particular piece of work, which impinges on many households right across Northern Ireland on a daily basis. Can I advise members that questions 2 and 10 have been withdrawn, so I now call Jimmy Spratt. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, question 3. Uh, the member will be aware that my predecessor had previously raised with the housing executive his concerns about the lack of maintenance and investment in relation uh, to the existing social housing stock and in particular concerns about delays in maintenance and investment in the housing executive's multi-storey tar blocks. And, uh, I would indeed share those concerns having come uh, into post. In relation to the multi-storey tar blocks, the Housing Executive were asked in May last year to review and identify the necessary work required and then to develop a focused maintenance strategy for the 32 tar blocks that are sited right across Northern Ireland. In order to deliver on this and as part of my department's and the Housing Executive's Asset Management Commission, which is currently being carried out by Savills, technical survey reports for the Housing Executive's multi-storey tar blocks are due by March of this year. A draft multi-storey asset management strategy is then due in May of this year. 
and these consultancy outputs will then be taken forward by the housing executive to develop and progress a strategic solution for multi-storey blocks in 2015 and beyond. However, whilst, whilst this work is ongoing and awaited, I task the housing executive to prepare an interim investment plan based on their current understanding of the stock. And the housing executive has now submitted to me an interim investment priorities plan which is built around a number of themes including bringing forward work to be carried out uh, to the multi-storey tower blocks. The purpose of the interim approach is to effectively bridge the gap that exists between now and the development of a comprehensive strategy for maintaining all of the housing executive's housing assets, leading in turn to a clear long-term funding strategy. I call Jimmy Spratt. Can I thank the Minister uh, for his answer? And can I ask the Minister to outline what else is being done in the interim to improve the housing executive stock, and in particular, in relation to multi-storey blocks, uh, what progress has been made on the cladding of the outside of those buildings, which, which had been previously suggested? Yep. Uh, it, in relation to what is being done in the interim, uh, to imp improve the housing executive stock. My officials met with the housing ex executive uh, officials in October of uh, 2014 to discuss the position in relation to the maintenance and investment strategy, uh, particularly the strategy for the multi-storey uh, tower blocks. And it was agreed at that meeting uh, that an interim investment priority plan would be developed. And the housing executive submitted their investment priority plan uh, in November, uh, and it was built around the tower blocks, the non-traditionals with reference to uh, the non-fines pilot, the stock transfer, thermal uh, efficiency, and so on. In relation to the issue that the member raises in regards to the cladding, uh, at present there is a scheme on site in uh, Cucullin in uh, the uh, tower blocks there and the Department and the Housing Executive Asset Management Commission and the preparation there for a new tower block strategy. Savills, as I've already said, has inspected the external structure of all the tower blocks and has been asked to provide recommendations on the need, the cost and all the ancillary works. And I'm awaiting to get a report as to how that's progressing to see what lessons we can learn uh, in relation to this. And indeed, I'm meeting the Housing Executive, uh, Chief Executive next week to continue to discuss this particular matter and to see what progress is being made and how we can develop it further. I call Alban McGuinness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And could I thank the Minister for his very detailed uh, answers. Uh, coming from North Belfast, I think about 25% of the tower blocks are in North Belfast, so there's special interest in them. Could I ask the Minister, in relation to the survey that's been carried out by the Housing Executive, will there be a focus on the type of tenancy uh, uh, in relation to uh, the future tenancy in tower blocks, and will there be uh, an additional concentration on energy efficiency in relation to tower blocks? Uh, thank you. Thank the member for uh, yet again reminding me about the needs of, of North Belfast, which he does uh, on, on a regular basis. Uh, I think that he, he raises an issue in relation to occupancy, which I think shouldn't be uh, anything different in terms of uh, occupancy right across the housing stock. However, given the nature of tower blocks, there are particular issues that need to be looked at, and it is something that I think uh, the Housing Executive does endeavour to give particular consideration to. However, given the fact that uh, the, the member has raised the point, what I will uh, undertake to do is to have part of that as a discussion when I meet with the Housing Executive next week. I think that the work that's currently ongoing, because I have a concern not only in relation to the, uh, the tower blocks which are currently in the member's constituency, but there are others across Northern Ireland, the 32 in total, uh, because I have gone uh, to see uh, in the member for South Belfast area uh, particular issues in relation to tower blocks. And I am concerned that we have allowed that particular element of stock in some places 
to deteriorate in a way which I think uh, the conditions in which individuals are living is, is not acceptable. And we do have to, given the nature of tar blocks, give particular consideration to whether or not there are additional measures given the way in which uh, we are now looking at uh, how heating is delivered in those particular properties. And I think that's a particular challenge for the housing executive. And I give the member assurance that I will come back to him uh, with uh, more information in relation to his first point. I call Robin Swan. Thank very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers to date. Uh, he has referred to the external, external cladding. Can the Minister maybe inform the House how many companies in Northern Ireland are capable of this work, and what steps he'll take to make sure there's no accusation of impropriety between any future decision on appointing a contractor to do that? In these properties, uh, there's no connection with his party or any of his elected representatives. I have to say I'm disappointed that uh, the member has to lower his political uh, activity in this House to that level. And, uh, and, yes, and, and I, I will give the, the member an answer. Uh, I don't have the numbers of the specific organisations which can apply, but what I will give an assurance to him and to this House that whatever contracts are carried out under my responsibility, they will be done in a way which will be open to public scrutiny in a way which is in uh, accordance with the law, and that there will be no grace or favour given to any organisation which has any association with either his party or any other party in this House. I don't think the member would expect anything else for me. I'm disappointed that he has levelled uh, that accusation uh, at the very beginning of this setting of this Assembly. I call Trevor Lund. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number four, please. Uh, in December 2014, my department published a series of uh, updates, uh, reports, which are uh, to show the potential impact of welfare reform on local uh, people. These information booklets can be found in the statistics and research section of the department's website under the heading Welfare Reform Briefing. Following the political discussions which led to the Stormont House Agreement, I will be bringing forward a paper to the Executive which puts forward further detail on the agreement and the modalities of implementation in relation to the changes. This would then enable the Welfare Bill to progress through the Assembly. And could I say to the member, uh, because sometimes uh, ministers come to the House and they make reference to something that's on their website, uh, of their department, and uh, then when members go, they find that it's maybe uh, less than fit for purpose. I can assure the member that if he visits a website in relation to the welfare reform briefing, he will have enough material and enough information that will keep him reading uh, for the next number of days. Uh, it's detailed uh, because this is uh, a very detailed issue in relation to all the, the various component parts of our welfare system, but I think that that information was updated that information is relevant and I think it will be valuable not only for the member and for the members of the House, but particularly for the general public. I call Trevor Lund for supplementary. Yes, thank, thank you, Minister, for that very detailed answer. Um, you referred to the Stormont House Agreement. Is there any aspect of that agreement on how to progress welfare reform that could not have been agreed at any stage over the last couple of years? <laughs> well, I, I, think maybe that's not, I think maybe that's not a question for the Minister. I think that's maybe a question for others Absolutely. who were responsible for actually uh, not allowing us to progress uh, the uh, Welfare Reform Bill. However, uh, whatever that may be, and however uh, one will interpret what has happened to date, I think that where we are at is a better position. Let's remember the scenario that was being painted before Christmas, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. It was a situation where we were facing uh, the uh, collapse of these institutions, where we were facing a situation where people didn't know if they were going to have the imposition of a welfare reform which had no changes to it. And I think that uh, when people begin to see the detail of uh, what has been agreed in addition to what had been agreed previously. And let's remember what was agreed previously was put out into the public domain by myself when I came into office, which did receive a fair win and a fair hearing. And I think that we need to build on the achievements over the uh, agreement in relation 
to the Stormont House uh, Agreement, and there is a huge amount of work. I have given an undertaking to this Assembly in relation to the information that we will bring to this Assembly in terms of the guidance notes, in terms of how the Bill will make its passage uh, through the House, and that will be subject to a paper that I trust I will be able to bring uh, shortly to the Executive so that we can progress this issue in a way which is efficient and effective, and so that no one in Northern Ireland uh, is adversely dis uh, disaffected as a result of these changes. Call Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister, as will the rest of us, be well aware that the uh, Welfare Reform Bill is now proceeding with no additional resources uh, being brought to bear from uh, Westminster, which uh, Sinn Féin said they would never do. Uh, but now that it is being done, can the Minister give us an outline, even in approximate terms, about the cost that there has been to his department and to taxpayers for the non-implementation of welfare reform to date? Well, obviously, the, the member has had uh, in the past the figures in terms of, of the fines, and I think that uh, when it comes to, uh, and I, I noticed that uh, we had the commencement of the debate uh, earlier in this chamber in relation to concerns about the budget and about the uh, issues of how uh, the, the party was worried in relation to the amount of money uh, that uh, was being removed from uh, various departments. I think that what we want to ensure is that we reduce and we remove uh, to the best of our ability those additional uh, fines that would be incurred as a result of the non-implementation of uh, the welfare uh, bill. And unfortunately, there has been uh, the money that uh, has gone in terms of the, the, first, uh, process, the first part of this process. And I trust that lessons have been learned by those who have imposed delay, because imposing delay has undoubtedly cost us money in terms of the Northern Ireland uh, uh, allocation and the Northern Ireland budget. I call Dolores Kelly. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, you did say in your initial answer about the detailed uh, information that there was on the website, and that's true. But we need, however, to distill what, are, what is very complex regulations down to key core messages. And that was one of the things I was asked on the street. So, Minister, can you state categorically that there will be no bedroom tax here in Northern Ireland? And, in fact, can you give some further uh, insight as to whether or not there will be uh, a cap on uh, benefit in, in terms of the uh, ceiling of benefit and paid? Thank the member for a question. I think those two issues were already agreed in terms of, of the previous package, in terms of the bedroom tax, and also in terms uh, in relation to the cap. And I think that when we see the detail uh, that will come to this house, I trust very soon, uh, we will be able to, in a very, uh, and I was going to say a very simple way, but I think it will always be difficult to make what is a complex process uh, because there are so many component parts. Uh, in terms of whether it is the, the uh, bedroom tax, whether it is the cap, whether it is PIP, whether it is all, all the various elements that make up the welfare reform package, to be able to, in every situation, be uh, definitive to the final point. However, I will give the member the assurance that we are endeavouring through uh, a campaign that we will run in terms of information to the public, that that is distilled in a way which is easy to understand and easy for them to grasp as to how it will impact on them and their families as we roll this process forward over the next number of weeks and months. I call Danny Kinnan. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. May I thank the Minister for his answers so far. And if I can home in on a little bit of detail, can the Minister provide an update on the suggested supplementary payment fund following the talks? And in particular, what, if any, further work has been done on calculating the level of support it will be able to offer to people who fall outside uh, the funding under universal credit. I yeah, thank the, the member for the, the answer. Therein lies one of the issues which we have to face in terms of the detail. And what we are currently working at is to bring a paper to the executive so that it will enable us to be able to bring that issue and the other raft of issues that are contained within the package to the House and start the debate in this Assembly. Because, uh, uh, however, I would put this caveat that uh, we don't have a huge amount of time. And I want, uh, as quickly as possible, to be able to move 
so that we bring the process to the Assembly, so that the issue that the member refers to, the issue that the previous uh, member referred to, uh, is uh, in the public domain, and some of this will be uh, necessary to be addressed in the uh, guidance that is issued by my department. And what I've said uh, both during the talks and I'm happy to say now in this public forum is that we will endeavour to ensure that in terms of those guidance, in terms of the way in which this is implemented, it will be done in a way that we understand the needs of people. Because if anything has been learned, Mr Deputy Speaker, in terms of the way that the particular universal credit has been ruled out in the rest of the United Kingdom. It has been uh, more in terms of its implementation rather than in terms of the overall policy intent. And I want to ensure uh, that uh, as to how this is rolled out in, in a practical day-to-day -day basis <laughs> across the jobs and benefit offices, that it is done in a way that people are not disadvantaged and people do genuinely have confidence that if there is a problem that is right, has arisen, that that problem will be addressed and will be dealt with in a fair and effective way. Moving on, I call Declan McAleer. Uh, question five, you know. Uh, my department worked in close partnership with the Citizens Advice uh, Bureau, the Advice NI, uh, in the development, implementation and delivery of the Financial Support Service pilot. The key representatives that the department liaised and engaged with, with were Mr Bob Strong, the Chief Executive, Kevin Higgins, Head of Policy from Advice NI, and Paul uh, Gallaghan, Head of Services from Advice, the Citizen Advice Bureau. They were instrumental in the design of the service, including the training of frontline advisors and in designing a mechanism for measuring the outcomes for budgeting uh, and for debt support. There were a number of very successful engagement events with frontline advisors in the advice sector and the Social Security Agency. All organisations were included in the design also that were involved in the evaluation of the scheme. In addition to the Citizens Advice NI and Advice NI, there was engagement with other support organisations such as Lifeline, Women's Aid and MenCap. Uh, and this was to inform them of the scheme and to gain their agreement and cooperation to provide their contract details in a signed posting leaflet. I appreciate greatly the commitment, time and effort that was afforded by my own department staff, the agency staff and the advice sector in helping to support the financial support service trials to inform an integrated joined up service that provides a more positive claimant experience and ensures that claimants can easily access the advice that they require. I call Declan McAleer. Uh, good, good. Could the Minister confirm that the agencies that he referred to have carried out successful benefit uptake campaigns? Yes, I, I can, and I think that the, the benefit uptake campaign is something which uh, we all need to uh, appreciate has been very successful. Uh, and those organisations have been involved uh, in that, and I think that we all have seen how that, that particular uh, scheme and that particular plan has brought huge benefit to many families for whom if it had not been in place uh, they would not have either had access to or would have benefited as a result of uh, the scheme and so I'm keen uh, to ensure that it continues I'm keen to ensure that we build on the success and we learn from uh, the this process because this was uh, in terms of this particular pilot, that this was not uh, perfect by, by no means. However, I think that that collaboration, as I said in response to a previous question, has given us an indication of what needs to be done in terms of how we continue to work to make sure that people have access to appropriate information and as a result of that information become the beneficiaries of access to benefits. I call David Hildage. Speaker, does the Minister plan to further test the financial support services in all their offices? 
thank the, the, the member for his question. And obviously, when we've had the completion of the pilots and the decision was taken not to proceed with the rollout of uh, a further test uh, in relation to the financial support services on the basis that at present the pilots didn't demonstrate that it would be uh, cost effective uh, given the concerns that were raised at the very beginning of uh, question time in relation to the cost of this particular pilot. However, the elements of the pilot that were uh, successful that I've, I tried to give some outline to previously, uh, the benefit entitlement check, the provision of the leaflet detailing the organisations that offer advice and support, these will be taken forward and introduced into existing service provision across the network of offices. And I think that that is something that we need to continue to work at, particularly in the light of the, the questions that have been asked earlier in relation to the rollout of uh, welfare reform. If there is going to be, as undoubtedly we will see over the next number of weeks and months, uh, considerable change to the system, uh, that needs to be done in a way that ensures that people have all the relevant advice available at their hand, and this will play a key part in relation to that. And that is the end of listed questions, and we now move on to topical questions. And I call Ms. Michelle McElveen. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister give details of the number of people in Northern Ireland who have benefited from the boiler replacement scheme? I uh, thank the member for the question. And the boiler replacement scheme was launched back in 2012, and the scheme provided grant funding of up to £1,000 to households with an income of less than uh, £40,000. And also there was the, the grant funding for the replacement of the uh, inefficient boilers over 15 years of age. To date, the latest available figures show that since the launch of the scheme, over 22,000 applications for uh, the grant have been approved, and over 17,000 households have uh, had uh, work completed. Uh, the replacing of an old inefficient boiler will save the households on an average uh, something like £400 per year and improve the thermal comfort of the home. So I think that uh, this is obviously uh, a good news story. It is uh, something that uh, people ha have benefited from and have seen the very tangible uh, benefits as a result of this particular scheme. Michelle McElveen for supplementary. Okay, thank you, and I, and I thank the Minister for his response. And certainly, um, constituents within my own area have benefited from that, and it has made a, a real difference to their lives. Will the Minister give consideration to extending the scheme beyond March 2015, when the current funding will end? Yes, and obviously, I've had uh, a number of uh, requests that this scheme would be. Uh, extend it. That's something that I'm giving uh, consideration to. Uh, I think given the fact that when you look at uh, w one of the other additional benefits that we've had as a result of this scheme is that somewhere in the region of 2,000 different installers have carried out work as part of the scheme and obviously that had a particular benefit to the local economy and just in case Maybe some of the members of the Unionist Party are listening. None of those contractors had anything to do with my party or me individually, so I can uh, declare that I had no uh, pecuniary or financial benefit came to me as a result of it. But it is something we're giving serious consideration to. I had a meeting with uh, Phoenix Gas uh, just uh, at the end of last week, uh, and obviously uh, they uh, have been very much uh, complementary in relation to the way that the boiler replacement scheme uh, was introduced and implemented and uh, we took on board comments that they made uh, in particular in relation to it. So uh, it is something that's on the in, on the in tray and uh, I may need to have further conversation with the finance minister to make sure that all available fi uh, funds are available so that we can progress accordingly. I call Peter Weir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for his assessment of how successful the landlord registration scheme has been since its uh, introduction last year? Uh, well, I, I thank the member for, for the question. Obviously, I've had some uh, landlords have come to me and, and they've expressed concern uh, 
uh, because uh, they, uh, there are those who believe that sometimes in that particular area you can have an over-regulation. But in terms of the, the current position, uh, the up-to-date uh, position is that over 12,000 landlords have registered and provided details of over 26,000 properties in Northern Ireland. Uh, the landlords have until the 25th of February to register uh, in regards to this particular scheme. Call Peter Weir for supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for his answer. Can I ask the Minister, in light of the fact that we're about six weeks away from the, um, the date by which landlords are required to register on the 25th of, of February 2015, uh, can I ask the Minister what's been done to remind uh, landlords of this deadline? Yes, yeah, so well, the members the members right that the scheme uh, in terms of the, of the deadline is the 25th of February. And what we have done is we have, I'm sure the member has seen a television uh, advertising campaign. Uh, we also have advertisements uh, on the side of buses, uh, street uh, liners, and that is something that we're doing to try and get the message across. Uh, however, I have to say that uh, we're, we're not trying to be in, in any way draconian in terms of the imposition of this. I genuinely want to get the message across. There's a benefit here for the landlord. There's a benefit also for uh, the people who live in the properties. And so therefore, I think, uh, as you'll probably find, uh, and I trust that this will be our experience, that as we get closer to the date of the 25th, it is more likely that the large remaining numbers that still have to register will uh, be compliant and those registrations will take place. Members were again picking up on some interference, so I again ask members to check their electronic equipment is not set in a position that will cause difficulties. And I call Sammy Wilson. Thank you, um, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. Would the Minister uh, indicate to us what has been the reason for the delay in the bringing forward the regeneration bill to this assembly, and as a result, of course, then bringing uh, the regeneration powers to the new local councils. When I took up office, uh, or rather when I was informed that I was taking up office, uh, it was clear to me that there were a number of issues which uh, needed to have a, a conversation as to why were we still in a state of uh, delay. And one of them was particularly in regards to the regeneration, as it was then known as the Regeneration and Housing Bill. And, I, and, I, and members uh, on the opposite side of this House, I trust, will bear testament to the fact that I endeavoured in the work that I did to address what were uh, seen and raised as issues. There have been previous correspondence to my predecessor, particularly around concerns uh, that within the context of the Regeneration Bill, there was uh, issues in regards to housing. And so what I quickly did was move to have those elements uh, uh, removed, taken out, so that we could, if possible, uh, ensure a, a, a speedy progress of that piece of legislation. By the time that that all was done, it then became uh, apparent that uh, we weren't able to bring the bill and have it through the processes of the House and to get royal assent before uh, the uh, summer of this incoming year, and therefore uh, agreement on accelerated passage was not possible. That's why next week I will bring the regeneration bill, not the regeneration housing bill. Uh, it will has now been changed, uh, and I trust I've addressed the issues that have been raised with me as concerns. I'm disappointed in the delay. Uh, however, the process, the legislative process of the bill, will commence in this house next week. Call Sammy Wilson. Maybe the Minister could spell out whether that delay was caused as a result of Sinn Féin's refusal to allow the bill to gain passage to the uh, Assembly here. And if that is the case, given that the budget which will be devolved to local councils will now be much lower than what it would have been had the powers been devolved this year, would he spell out how much Sinn Féin's delay tactics are going to cost local councils in terms of regeneration expenditure over the next number of years? Well, obviously, the member gives a, uh, an overview of, of the current position. In terms of the budgetary implications, 
that will be determined when we conclude uh, the current process in regards to the draft budget and when I know exactly what is the financial uh, position of the department. However, I think the member is right that it will, uh, in, it will lead to a situation where the amount of money that is uh, going to be transferred along with the powers that will be transferred will be less than was previously uh, envisaged. And I think that uh, obviously it is maybe convenient for some members in this House that that will happen under a particular uh, ministry, a particular uh, uh, department other than their own, so that the blame can rest with uh, the current minister as being the person or the individual who has not been able to deliver the full package. However, I would remind members that uh, as far as I was aware when I came into the House uh, today, it still was a five-party mandatory coalition and therefore it is a responsibility of the executive in relation to this issue. However, I will say this, that I have had discussions. The DOE minister set up a, a panel uh, to look at the issue of transition, uh, obviously over a range of issues. And I attended the first of that uh, uh, panel just before Christmas. And I gave an undertaking to the councils. In fact, the dates have now been uh, almost secured in my diary to go out to councils and to sit down with the new authorities and where possible as much as within the power that I have within the department to work with councils to mitigate against the elements of the reduction in the budget and to ensure that my department in the transition along with the councils are giving priority to what they see as the schemes that they would like to progress in their particular area. But be under no illusion, there is no doubt it will be challenging and it will have an impact financially on those councils. I call Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister for his assessment of his department's new affordable uh, warrant scheme, and particularly in light of uh, the restructuring of local councils? Uh, I thank, thank the member for uh, her question, and, and obviously it follows on from uh, the member writing to me. And, and can I thank the member for taking the time to give, uh, I have to say, a very comprehensive assessment of what she saw practically on the ground as issues that were being raised. And in that response that I trust the member will, if she hasn't already received it, uh, it was signed off, uh, and I, I trust she will soon get it. She did raise the issues around capacity of the councils, the risk uh, uh, that a targeted approach uh, is not equitable. But I believe that this scheme will be uh, valuable. It will add to what was the previous scheme. There will undoubtedly be challenges around any implementation, but I have endeavoured to make sure that comments that have been made to me by the member in correspondence are addressed, are listened to, and that we roll this scheme out in the most efficient and effective way so that people who have been targeted in a particular way, different to the previous scheme, and I trust that that will give a greater sense of urgency in relation to addressing their needs. I call Dolores Kelly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I thank the Minister for his comments. Uh, uh, Minister, you did uh, say about efficient and effective, and I do welcome, and our party did welcome, the extension and the greater inc uh, the inclusion of a greater number of people to be able to access uh, uh, help with uh, warmth, warm in their homes. But, Minister, was this scheme uh, subject to a uh, uh, value for money review? Yes, and uh, a business case for the new scheme was examined by the department's economist and submit it in a business case for approval from DFP. I call Gregory Campbell. Deputy Speaker, recently the Minister outlined uh, funding for a hotel feasibility study in the Port Rush area. Could he outline the rationale for that study? Uh, thank the member for uh, the, the question in relation to Port Rush. The Port Rush Regeneration Strategy, which was produced a number of years ago, indicated that, that the development of a large four-star hotel could have a major regeneration impact on the resort. And my department is responsible for the urban regeneration, so we have been working closely with Corian Borough Council to bring forward the project identified in the strategy, including the hotel. Uh, and the scoping study is an important piece of work because it will, uh, I trust, be used to determine what the next step should be in the development of a new hotel for Port Rush. I call Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I thank uh, the Minister for his answer and his interest in the issue? He will be aware, of course, that the, there's a very real prospect 
of the Open coming to Portrush as early as 2019. Uh, can I outline what plans his department have in preparation for that what will undoubtedly be a momentous event? Yes, I thank the, the member and also uh, I know that the member has raised with me as, as his uh, council colleague, uh, Mr Trevor Clark, uh, in relation to concerns by some local hoteliers about the, even the, the scoping uh, exercise that we're currently carrying out and the member will know that we've agreed to meet with those uh, local hoteliers who have raised uh, some practical issues and we intend to do that uh, pretty soon. Uh, in terms of the issue of the open, uh, obviously I believe that Port Rush needs to continue the progress that has been made and anyone who has visited Port Rush recently will I think be uh, undoubtedly impressed by the public realm works that have been carried out, uh, in particularly in front of Barry's and also the East and West Strand. And I think also uh, anyone who has been in Port Rush over the holiday period and over in recent days, what I have described as a restaurant re revolution has gone on. Uh, the number of people who now see Port Rush as a location uh, for that night economy in terms of restaurants is, I think, a credit to those who have been involved. There will be uh, further work carried out between the Port Rush Regeneration Strategy, Coleray and Borough Council and my department to ensure that every possible step is taken to have Port Rush in the best possible shape and in the best possible place when the Open comes to Northern Ireland. And I think that's something that we all need to work towards. That's why I also plan to bring to the executive a paper which I trust will have support from my executive colleagues as how collectively we continue to enhance Portrush for the local tourist industry and for the wider uh, tourist improvement that I believe it will be well placed to deliver for. And that is the end. The question